Thank you. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for coming. And if there are any serious um, football fans that gave up the football game to come here, I thank you for that. <laughs> um, when you awake from deep sleep, you are on the verge of passing through one of the most remarkable transitions that any creature can pass through, which is the passage from sleep and unconsciousness up through the different levels of sleep and finally to fully conscious, full consciousness. Unfortunately, the way this usually happens, you're a little groggy and then things start coming into your mind and you go off and you start going on your day. So you, you never take time and reflect on the experience. It, it just doesn't work that way unless you really practice and drill yourself. Take time for the experience of actually seeing this emergence in which I think the best way to describe it is the lights come on. Uh, and sound comes on, the world is buzzing, and this is just how it is. Uh, but in fact, it's a really incredible and marvelous fact that we can, we have this capacity, and it's mainly concentrated in the brain and through the whole nervous system of the body to do this. Uh, now, there are many creatures uh, in our whole world of life that are sentient. That means it, they, they can be hurt, they experience pleasure and pain, uh, and they are even, we could say, intelligent in the sense that they have the capacity to acquire knowledge, maybe minimal knowledge about where a particular uh, kind of animal might be found as a food supply. So it might, but they have a capacity to acquire knowledge and act on it, put it to use. So there's a way in which sentient creatures are also intelligent. In fact, I think those of you who have been to some of my previous lectures may have been amazed when I t told you that atoms and molecules are also intelligent in a very limited way. But sentient creatures are not necessarily conscious. So consciousness is about knowing that you're feeling, knowing that you know. And we're going to see how this ability of the very large brain that we have uh, inherited from our ancestors has the capacity to do that, to not only to execute complex feelings, thoughts, plans, and so on, but to actually also know that it is doing that. And to know it in a way, in the same way that suddenly you know photons are coming into your eyes, the lights are on when you wake up from sleep. So, um, I need to find where the it is. So, what we have uh, really here is the whole world in which we're all a part, the whole creation, is this outer world. And we are too part of that world, but we also are inhabiting an inner world. And the inner world is got a representation of the outer world in it. We have the capacity to do that. So there's a way in which the outer world makes its way into and is present in the inner world. Uh, and in fact, that's the whole gist of what we'll be doing this afternoon is talking about that connection. Now. The inner world, here you see an outer world, man, tree, dog. I guess that's a pretty good representation of the outer world. And here's somebody looking at the man, tree, and dog. And here is a little blow up of part of his brain. I don't think this is quite the correct region for this, but that's, it doesn't matter. 
In fact, there are multiple regions where this, these images are going to be stored. The important thing is you see these neural networks. These are networks of nerve cells which you can think of roughly like a telecommunication network, if you'd like. Wires that wire things together and send messages and communicate and can cause actions to take place. And here you see a little pattern of these spikes. This network is oscillating. It's oscillating and it's creating this spiky pattern with the oscillations. These oscillations take place at about 10 to 30 times a second. And those oscillations are encoding. They have an encoded image of, in this case, the dog. So here's what that looks like, and that's why there is a representation of the dog in the brain. So we have the outer world, and we have a brain map which maps the outer world onto the inner world. So what is a map? A map, familiar map, is to sort of take something and make a facsimile of it or a representation of it so that there's something of the original in the map or what we call the source. So if we have a brain map, it takes the input, the source, which in this case is the dogs, trees, man in the outside world, and maps the output, which is sometimes called the target. So in this case, the outer world is the input, and the target is the inner world of the brain. So here is a neural network that has executed the brain map, and the important point to understand is that the neural network is both the agent of the map. Those oscillating neural network patterns both organize the gathering of that information, and they also provide a place to store it, where you put the image. Like if you had a photograph and you put it in a drawer, the, the network has a place to put it. Uh, this neural network is both the agent, it does the job of getting that image of the dog in, and it sticks it in the brain someplace. Also, again, in an oscillator that, that holds that image. Now, I just want to show you how things get into the brain that are physical and outside the brain, and it's all up and down the whole uh, creation of life, from, the, from fishes all the way up to human beings. This is, these are zebrafish. Some of you who have aquariums may even have zebrafish in your aquarium. Uh, they're a nice uh, experimental fish because they're transparent. So you can put uh, tracer molecules on the parts, on the molecules that are constructed, uh, the proteins that are constructed for the brain. And the brain of the fish will have this little extra calcium uh, ion here. And the calcium is uh, optically very active so that you can then get it to fluoresce and you can get a picture of when that neuron is firing, it's going to make a picture for you. And you can see it because the fish is transparent. It's a transparent brain. Imagine if we had transparent brains. That would be kind of, we'd know a lot more about us. Um, so these fish feed on paramecia, which are uh, single cell uh, critters, they're microscopic single cell critters, but they, they, can, they can see them and track them with their eyes. So if a paramecium is swimming, this is a, this is a, a zebrafish, this is the brain, this is the track of the paramecium that is in the 
visual field of the fish's eye. So that's, that's the field in the eye. Uh, it would also be if you had some kind of optical instrument watching, watching the paramecium. It didn't even have fish, but you just had some kind of microscope watching it. That's what you would get. Doesn't, you don't need the fish for this. Oops. Um, but here, simultaneously, is the trajectory of that paramecium in the brain of the zebrafish. So from eye to brain, there is the trajectory. Oh, let me see. I just want to make an important point again, underlining this. The neural networks both are the agents of tracking, they do the tracking, and they also are the medium in which the track is registered. So this set of brain cells in the fish organize oscillators that oscillate and do the tracking with the eye, and then they also store the result of the track in that network. There's a way in which the computers in life are not like the computers that we make for the most part. Everything is all mixed up together. The input, the, the printer, the uh, scanner, the display, the central processor, the memory modules, they're all kind of mixed up together. They're not all separate. That's the way nature has splattered this out. And that is the beauty of evolution in which these things just come into being little step by little step. Um, and then you end up with this magnificent uh, capacity. Uh, one more example of how the outer world is brought into the inner world. This is a mouse. And one of the important things that tracks the outer world for a mouse and a lot of mammals like mice are whiskers. The whiskers are probably as important as the eyes. So here is the mouth, mouse's whiskers. And here, you notice, if you look at a mouse, they're very organized. They kind of form a nice grid. And here is the mouse whiskers, and here are the grids, and here all these whiskers are labeled. I think <laughs> mouse whiskers must be a little bit like teeth. When you go to the dentist, they know it's number 18. Well, here are all the whiskers. And this is a section through the mouse brain. These are all different sections through the mouse brain. And you see how that pattern is resident now in the neurons of the brain, in, in these oscillating neural networks. And you have to think of them as being pretty dense. There are lots of little oscillators interacting and oscillating with each other. And here is a, we're not going to see the inside of the brain, but it would be interesting to see it, of a lizard catching uh, an insect. And the whole coordination of that tongue and the insect and the fly and the tongue going out and reaching the fly. There's a track in that lizard's brain. If he had a transparent brain like a zebrafish, we could surely see it. I want to say something now about storage media and the brain. That is, how does the brain store things? And it's clearly, it, it clearly does it. It's not clear at all yet. There are two basic mechanisms, and I'm going to just mainly talk about the oscillatory one, that the oscillation of these uh, neural networks can store information because it can oscillate at different frequencies and different sections can oscillate differently from other sections. So those are all ways of distinguishing notes. If you can distinguish notes, you can distinguish letters. If you can distinguish letters, you can make information and tell one thing from another. So I just want to mention that uh, uh, here is uh, Richard III by Shakespeare, Sir Lawrence Olivier, uh, starring in the, in, the, in, the, in the movie. And you can buy that on a DVD, and you can watch it. And if you watch Richard III, your blood pressure will vary depending upon what's happening. 
uh, if in a particularly intense scene, your palms may sweat. Uh, you will be filled with dread or joy in different places. And there may be even places uh, where uh, you will weep. All of those things are happening with this little disc of plastic. So, and in that is that famous scene in which Richard III says he's thrown off his horse in the great final battle of his reign and he's losing and he's definitely going down and now that he's unhorsed, he, he needs a horse and he has that famous line, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. And that is on this DVD. But is that Shakespeare? We're going to talk more about that in just a minute, but this is just a warm-up for the discussion I'd like to have towards the end of this lecture. So, the way this works is with little bits of on and off, where there's a cavity here that's essentially off, and where there is a smooth surface, uh, the bit is essentially on, and there's a laser light that will make those pits, these little pits, and there's another laser that reads the DVD that reads the difference between the pit and the shiny surface and records that like a letter in the alphabet. And that letter, in this case it's just a zero one alphabet, there's only two letters, or A, B. And with that you build up any text and the text tells the display how to light up colors of pixels that then match the uh, uh, intensity of signals from a uh, television camera or a uh, movie camera. They're now all digital. And these things are all transformed one to another using this code, using a code, but it's it's basically an encoded DVD that is zeros and ones, or A and B, on and off. And the brain is doing something like that. Uh, may not be quite that same kind of code, but it's a code of different oscillation frequencies that allow you to have different information and build up a picture in the same way that Richard III can be built up and Sir Laurence Olivier can emerge out of a piece of plastic. So here is, the, here is the parallel. This is the DVD in Richard III, but here's the dog in our original picture, and here is the encoded picture of the dog, not in the dog's brain, but in the human brain that is looking at the dog. So here are the on and off, and here is a kind of pattern of on and off. So the first thing we're going to talk about now is mapping the outer world, the whole outer world that we all live in, to the inner world of the brain through the senses. So all, kind of, all kinds of animals do this, and we do it too. So that's the first thing to talk about. So. Here is an image of these neural networks. This isn't particularly the one that does all these things. I'm just using it as a, as a kind of placeholder. So we have a neural network, and we have sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell as sort of primary senses. So our visual sight is going into a very important part of the brain called the visual cortex. So this is all getting into that neural network, the auditory cortex, works with our, our ears. And touch, taste, and smell mainly come through the nervous system and up through the brain stem. So the, not only is, are we going to map the outer world, that's the dog, the tree, the man, but the brain, the body and the brain work together to also map into the brain the internal state of the body like its temperature and uh, 
in fact, it's a whole rich constellation of things that are mapped, not just one or two little things. And they basically tell the condition of the body. Pain, pleasure, all of those things are also mapped onto the inner world of the brain. So the inner world of the brain has the outer world flowing through the senses, and it also has a kind of outer world to the brain, which is the state of the whole body. And that's being fed up through the brain stem into the brain as well. So there's sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, and all those. And then temperature, body chemistry. This is a huge, long list. It's huge. So a sentient creature has two worlds in which it lives. Uh, the first world is the outer world in which we all live, the universe even if you like. But a sentient creature also has a world that's built from a nervous system, a world of the out, that is the inner world map of the outer world and the state of the body. That's what will be mapped into the brain. Sentient creatures are not necessarily conscious, but they do feel pain and pleasure, and they do respond to inputs and outputs and act. Now, a conscious creature also lives in a third world. I'm using world kind of metaphorically here, but there's a third world which we as conscious creatures also have. It's the inner world map of the inner world to itself. It is like the brain watching the brain itself. And it's through this capacity that self, our sense of self, comes into being. So, I'm going to try to describe how this works, how consciousness comes into being, and I'm going to use a metaphor. The metaphor is a movie production company. They're going to use a movie production company to, to, to show the dynamics of how uh, consciousness comes about. So here's a movie production company. And I don't have everything here. But a movie production company's got cameras, it's got audio gear, cameras for the visuals, audio gear for the sound. It's got a library where the rushes, that is the earliest uh, uh, output of the camera and, uh, is, is located. And also, finished products can be put in the library as well. It also has editors and writers and property managers and uh, technicians to make sure that the cameras are working and that the batteries are charged and on and on and on. So it's a big deal. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of people in a movie production company. And what that movie production company is focused on is some kind of subject. Some kind of subject or a collection of subjects. But there's an outer set of subjects that the movie production company is trying to make a movie about. So that's, that's clear enough. Uh, but now I want to talk about a kind of more complicated movie production company. This one's called Consolidated Movie Production Company. And what it does is, first of all, it's got a documentary production company that makes documentaries, which means they are true to somehow the external world, so to speak, because they're documentaries. There's no fiction involved. It's true documentary. Now, of course, we know documentaries aren't really like that. Suspend your judgment about that for the time being. This is the documentary. And so this is just what we've just been calling the movie production company. It's the same thing. Uh, but we're now going to change the subject. The subject of our documentary production company, we, we're not going to use just any old subject. We're going to use the other movie production company that's in our big conglomerate of consolidated movie production company, we're going to use the other one 
the one that we just talked about that's doing the subject that's in the outer world. And this new company, which is in the consolidated movie production company, and as you, what I want you to know is this is still all inside the brain, uh, they have writers and editors and they have libraries and so forth, but they don't have cameras and sound systems. What they have are neural circuits, wires, wires that can connect to the movie production company. So this, movie, this documentary production company is putting some wires in and it's, it's recording and it's watching and describing and making a movie of the other company making a movie. So it's a movie of making a movie. Can you wrap your, can you wrap your head around that? Yeah. It's a movie of making a movie. Um, and notice that this documentary production company, as I've called it, doesn't have any cameras or sound equipment. Doesn't need them, it'll just, it'll take it off over here. Because it has access to this other company over here. It'll just go in and get the sound and the visuals off it. Doesn't need any of its own. All right. So now I want to tell, talk to you about the amalgamated, consolidated movie production company. <laughs> it makes movies of movies of all kinds. So we have our good old original movie production company over here, which is focused on the external world, the outside world. And then we have our documentary production company, which you which we just visited and which doesn't have any cameras or sound equipment, but gets its information from the first one. And now we have a fantasy production company. Fantasy production company makes stuff up because it can draw upon a library of dogs and trees and men that the other ones have produced from the outside world. But once it gets them, it can do other stuff with them. It can put wings on the dog and have a dog that flies. It can make up fantasies of all kinds. And so our fantasy and imaginative capacities come about because we have a brain that can use material that was originally gained from the external world. Notice how the external world is kind of a little guy out here. But that material was gained from real dogs, real trees, real skies, real things. And then once it's in the brain, and not only in our brain, but in those that we know in the whole social milieu, we draw on that as well. That's a much bigger story. We're not going to tell that story today. But uh, this is just how consciousness is going to arise from these three different kinds of companies. Um, so, let's just realize that this kind of production companies within the brain, different agents with different tasks, pulling things from the outside world that one of these, or actually it's just that there are bits and pieces of all of them that have a capacity to be watching what the other is doing. So there's a way in which the experience of waking up and all the lights are on and actually focusing on it is the ability of part of the brain to be making a movie of what another part of the brain is doing. It's looking with the eyes out into the external world and to actually know that it's doing it because you have the capacity to do that. These are, these are all intelligent systems. So the sense of consciousness is about knowing that we know about being aware of vision and sound is because 
the very things that are working hard on vision and sound and don't have any space to think about it are not the whole story. There's a part of the brain that doesn't have to worry about all those details of how you get from the optical nerve into the visual cortex and so on. It just is there kind of taking it in and saying, cool. Um, so that's, this is, this is the, the uh, story of consciousness. Um, if we had a course structure, this would be consciousness 0, 0.0, which you have just been told about. Um, now, because um, consciousness raises a lot of questions about mind. Where is the mind? Is the mind, where is the mind in all this consciousness behavior? The mind is surely resident in the brain. The mind needs the brain. But uh, the other thing that often comes up with the issue of consciousness is the issue of spiritual reality. Is there, is there something about consciousness and spiritual reality that's particularly important. Um, now, what I would say is that, first of all, uh, the relationship between the material world, things that are hard, solid, that we think are so physical, rock, concrete, and the immaterial, things that are flighty, things that are you can't get your hands on, this, this is much more pervasive all through our existence than we generally realize. And the physical, when you press hard on it, dissolves into quantum waves. There's no little marble there as a molecule. That's not what it is. There's no little ball bearing that's a particle bouncing around. When you push hard and push into its depths, you find that it's a wave. And that wave is a completely ethereal thing. It doesn't it's like Richard III. So, we have Richard III as a creation of Shakespeare, but he was a historical figure. Uh, his body was actually exhumed uh, three or four years ago, and the DNA in it was compared with some of his living descendants and found to match. And it also seemed to be where people thought it had been trashed during that up, upheaval. So uh, Richard III is a historical figure, but he also lives mainly through Shakespeare's great play. But when you ask, well, where is Richard III? Well, that's Richard III, isn't it? This is a 1597 uh, folio of the tragedy of Richard III. It's printed, there is all the text, you can read it. And if I put this into your lap and said, this is Richard III, you wouldn't think that that was strange or weird. But that printed ink on paper is clearly not Richard III. Richard III is something immaterial. It's not, it is physically embodied. And in fact, it has to be physically embodied. If it's not going to be ink on paper, maybe it'll be the voices of the actors playing it out on stage. Or it'll be the DVD of Laurence Olivier. But you can't just have air and no medium. But that's the, the thing about it is it's indifferent to precisely the medium. It could be a DVD, it could be the actors' voices. Um, that is the kind of marvelous nature of our reality, is it has this amazing solidity, very deeply physical, there's no doubt about it. Those voices of the actors are real flesh and blood uh, speakers speaking. But the things we make, the things we do, the thoughts we live, these are, these escape the physical. They're not physical. So, 
Here's a, there's, there were some paintings made of Richard III. I don't know how accurate they were. And this is, this is from one of them. And of course, there's Laurence Olivier. Uh, but Richard III, like just about everything else in our existence, is a great mystery. And uh, maybe we've pulled back the curtain a little bit. At least, at least we, we, we understand how consciousness can work because of the brain having this capacity to watch itself, to know that it is thinking when it is thinking. Yes? What's oscillating? The nerve? The molecules in the nerve? I couldn't figure out what was oscillating. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, a neuron has a synapse, which is a junction when a nerve fiber called an axon comes down and touches another nerve fiber, there's a junction there, and it fires every now and then. It fires when all of the other fibers coming into the, to the nerve body reach a certain critical threshold, and then it fires. Uh, and they all do this. Now, what it is is an oscillating network. So if you had... Um, they're both electrical and chemical, both. Electrical and chemical. The electricity and the chemicals work together because the, the chemicals are ions and they're charged. So there's electrical currents that flow in these fibers and they're supported by uh, the chemistry of the, of the chemicals. I don't know precisely, nobody knows the, the whole way in which the neural network encodes information and transfers it in and transfers it out is still a subject right on the forefront of current research. But there is no doubt that networks oscillate, that their oscillation is a big part of how they store information. The, the oscillators have regions. So there are re regions that that may oscillate and have a certain set of patterns and encode certain instructions that are rather independent of another region. So it's a really, it's almost like a little city. Uh, you wouldn't describe what's going on in a little city by trying to describe uh, that in every little apartment there's a conversation going on. Uh, it's noisy. It's noisy. But there are also some very orderly things that are going on. Everybody seems to get up and go out at around 6 to 8 in the morning. So that goes on. Um, there's something about the idea of thinking about the brain like a little civilization, like a little city. And the various neural networks can act as agents. Now, this is not how it works exactly because this is, I'm trying to use too simple a system, but I think this will work. So we, we have, here's the setup I'm just imagining here. We have something that the eye's going to see, and what we want to do is, and I'll make it simple because the body actually does act this way. If, the, if what it sees is a face, we want to we send it to a certain particular nerve in the brain. And if what it sees is an upside down milk bottle, we're going to send it to a different place. And actually the brain really does work that way. So you can see that <coughs> if um, the eye opens and our pendulums here, uh, if the light can't see, doesn't resonate with this motion, it's invisible, it's not going to, it'll put the information be in a default location, just stick it there. But if it's going like this, and the light comes in, it resonates with this frequency, with this motion, rather, resonates with this motion, and it will put it in that place where we recognize faces. Something like that, and this is very crude, but that's how the storage of information and the agency that collects the information can be all built out of the same thing, a nerve cell. Uh, questions?
Yeah, I wonder if you can speak to how uh, the concepts you talked about today uh, interact or relate to the practice of mindfulness. Say it again? How the concepts uh, oh, uh, today could I ask you all when you ask a question? People are interested in your question, so do speak up. How about if I stand up? Then? Sure. I'm interested to know how the concepts you've talked about today are related to the practice of mindfulness. If mindfulness. You can speak to that at all, if that relates to. Sure. Sure. Um, that's a big subject. Uh, first of all, although we we are very robotic in a lot of our behavior. We may not like that. We may not like to have to admit that. But we are very robotic. And there's a way in which we need to be. Uh, if you think about as many different things as I think about when I'm driving a car, it's really important that I be slightly robotic. Um, and that is just part of our nature. But in the same way that the whole universe is built upon order and predictability, there is this unpredictable, small, random element that ultimately goes back to the quantum. And those elements are the, the genius behind evolution, the artistic nature of, of the universe. All of those things are from that unpredictability in the midst of complete order. I jump up down right now. I'm going to come right back down. Gravity is going to make me come down. I'm going to do that. Now, in that zone of freedom, we can kind of fritter it away. We can run after all kinds of chimeras. Or we can sometimes do something that's really fruitful. And maybe we don't even know how to tell the difference. So I would answer you by saying, we have a freedom in the mind, small. And we also have very ingrained behaviors that we have built up over the course of a lifetime and our ancestors have built up and handed them down to us. Mindfulness, it, this is one perspective on mindfulness. Mindfulness is an attempt to try to <coughs> reach into the creative possibilities that we all have. And to not be ruled by the many necessary robotic behaviors that we have. Um, I know that's not the whole story at all. This is just a per very personal take on it. So to do that, you need to be mindful. And of course, that is a kind of special thing in itself. If you just say, I'm going to be mindful, I am now a mindful person, you're on the wrong track. Uh, but that, that's the, the reality, I think, is that there is this freedom that threads everything in the midst of all of the order and determinism that's there. And I think mindfulness is just one of, the, one of the aspects of mindfulness is a way of trying to uh, creatively and um, fruitfully use that freedom. Yes? As you were speaking, I, um, I've been intrigued. Um, one of my heroes is Albert Einstein and his um, idea that time is not the past or the future, but in the now, but actually he takes it into a fourth dimension. That to Einstein, time as we are living it is not just the past or the future and very much the now, what we're experiencing, but there is, there is a broader concept, it's kind of like beyond a veil, that is the power of this connection, this um, unconscious, conscious connection <coughs> to um, a part of ourselves that we can touch the richest in the now, like not yesterday, not tomorrow, but this very mindful now. 
Um, but he takes it into a fourth dimension, which is very interesting. Well, uh, space-time, since Einstein, yeah. is four-dimensional. Right, space-time. And uh, that's the reality, and it's been verified for, uh, uh, well, actually, just about 100 years right now. Right. Yeah, just about 100 years right and now. And the mindfulness of right now, like you're there, and we're listening to you, and we're here, is important, not... Well, of course, you know, of you know what relativity does say is that somebody who's passing by going at a different speed has a different right now than I do. Yes, that's true. It's their own. Um, yes, that's a good way to put it. Their and, own. Yeah, yes. it's called the, the, the proper time of a reference frame is the one in which you are at rest. Thank and you. everything is at rest with you. Thank you. Yes. I think you just explained to me this afternoon of why sometimes when I have a dream, the documentary company gets screwed up <laughs> with the fantasy company. <laughs> it has situations. <laughs> you have a situation here, and then they come in and they put the wrong people in it, <laughs> wrong age. True. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it also explains our capacity for fantasy. Yeah. And our, our difficulty sometimes in trying to distinguish what is a fantasy from what is the reality. There's a recent one that I'm really quite familiar with uh, that involves the uh, superposition principle in quantum mechanics, where a body can be in two places at once. Now, these are microscopic atomic particles. Uh, and that's true, that's true. Uh, and it, it is a puzzle and a mystery about how they finally get established in one place. You're not seeing me in several places at once right now. When we have bodies that are built up of 10 to the 19th molecules and atoms, the, there's a way in which that rich structure of all these atoms and molecules cancel out all of these superpositions and settle on one. Settle on one. Well, there are some people who thought, well, this is cool. It means the whole universe is entangled together. This idea of, of being in several places at once means you can also be entangled in, with, other with other places. Maybe people on Alpha Centauri are entangled with us. And that's just uh, a misreading of uh, entanglement. Uh, so the, the truth is that these particles decohere very quickly. And it's a good thing they do because I would just evaporate if they didn't. Uh, so the idea of being entangled with the whole universe, it's an attractive um, kind of... Uh, idea. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's pleasing to think that the whole universe is entangled together, but it's not true in the quantum mechanical sense in which people take that and then run with it to make a fantasy. Uh, fortunately, we've got a lot of documentary filmmakers who are still working and, and can do the experiments that show that, that this, is, this can't be done on that kind of large scale. But we are very good at making up fantasies. And this is, this is the way we do it, is because we can operate on the inputs, the hard, solid inputs from the natural world that get into our minds, then have an, a life in the mind that we can pick them up and make things with them and do things with them, and do, do it together. Do it together, making up things. Um, I don't want to knock that completely because we often in developing scientific theories have to make up things. Could it be like that? Einstein making up the idea that uh, it's not three dimensions in space with a clock standing outside it, but it's really a four dimensional thing unto itself, one holistic thing. Uh, that took imagination which is a little different from fantasy, I think.
Yes. Okay, not all sentient beings are conscious. Can you determine what beings are conscious? Is that possible? Is it just humans, or can you tell if other mammals <laughs> are conscious? That's um, a good question. Is there some way to scientifically tease that out? That's a good question. It's a hard, a hard one to answer because it's very hard to do experiments to, uh, on other animals. Um, there's a story that, um, I've forgotten his name now, uh, an eminent uh, anthropologist told of seeing a chimpanzee at a waterfall in Africa. And the chimpanzee, and it, apparently it's a very beautiful waterfall and a lot of the local tribes people would go there. It was a slightly sacred space, but it wasn't a temple or anything like that. And obviously a very wonderful spot to be. And he was standing back and watching the chimpanzee. And he said he could not help but feel that this animal was experiencing something of the the wonder and the peacefulness and the freshness of the mist and the rainbows, that that animal was experiencing uh, what he experienced. Now, that's not exactly the same as consciousness, but it is uh, seeing that animals can experience something that is not just brute pleasure or brute pain a slightly more sophisticated pleasure of the waterfall and the rainbows and the mist. And uh, I don't think that gets us very far on answering the question of whether the uh, chimpanzee is conscious. Um, I think in some limited ways the chimpanzees are conscious. Yes. They, the lights come on for them in the morning too. And like us, they never think about it. Um, yes? There were, were yes. Really some experiments done recently about dogs and humans and the fact that chemically they can determine that a dog and a human are relating by what, the, when they see, look into each other's eyes, that there is some, mm -hmm. are you familiar with um, and Do you know how they got at the chemicals? Were no, they? I don't. Mm -hmm. But they, they said that they I'm not familiar with it, but I'm not at all surprised. Yeah, yeah. If you have dogs, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's not it's, surprising. It's intuitively you, it's pleasing. You see they, they relate happens, to you. They watch what you're doing. Yeah, they do. Uh, I have, I, one of our dogs actually can uh, get pointing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Most dogs can't understand pointing. but. Uh, she can almost get it. Yeah, well, they, they found that the chemicals were the same, the, producing the same kind of chemicals, and it's been a lot Must have meant that that was related to the same kind of sensation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, let's have, yes? Well, I was just curious what your opinion was of the unconscious mind. You know, Freud always talked about well of I'm glad happens. you mentioned that because... But, but what yeah. about the unconscious mind just being, you know, like, the brain stores that information for our protection in the future, and does it store it, like, at the cellular level? Because it's something that I've heard recently, and I was just curious what your opinion was of what our unconscious mind really could be. Well, the next lecture on February 2nd, is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is the topic is going to be the subconscious. So we will have that, uh, we, will, we will deal with unconscious and subconscious. February, yeah. February 2nd. Yes. How long could you retain a memory in your brain? Do you think that's possible? Could I tell you something that happened to me? I was sleeping. And all of a sudden, two little hands would come up to look at me, and like little blonde hair, and then my mother said, be careful, don't tip over your system. My brother is 15 months older than I am. Uh -huh, uh -huh. How could you at that end? Well, look at all the past over 70 years. How old were you, do you think, when that happened? 
I, I had to be in a baby, a uh, baby. Because uh, like I say, it was just little hands and that blonde hair. And then my mother speaking, you know, oh, tip over usually your sister, it's, the brain, and I woke up. The human brain is usually not sufficiently developed for any serious memories before about 14 or 15 months. And that's why most of us can't remember things very well at all beyond, right. you know, when we well, were two. Well, I can remember from two on. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, just, you can have long-term memory. That just happened to happen. I've never had that happen before. Well, uh, we have well, long-term memories, strange. and I must say, I, I actually haven't been thinking about this a whole lot. A couple of months ago, I was just kind of in a meditative state, and I was thinking, all right, if the major mechanism of storage of information in the brain is with an oscillator, and we have memories that go back to childhood, and sometimes some of them are very vivid, that oscillator has been ringing, in my case, for 74 years. Well, no, 72, sorry. Um, and I was thinking, do, do the nerves maybe say, I, I'm tired of doing this, you take over for a while and, and run it for the next 30 years? <laughs> um, and pass it on? And that is a possibility. Or is it that same nerve cell, that same that is that was in the two-year-old child is still, is still going? Now it's true that the heart muscle that was in that child is still going, and that also is an oscillator. Uh, similar to that, it was my understanding that if you experience some trauma, major trauma, that those memories kind of stay within within you. Sure. You, at a very young age. Sure. Yeah. Bill. Uh, uh, I was just watching a TV show just last week, and I can't remember which one it was. But there are people that they're discovering have total recall, and you can ask them, and they're finding it in some children now. You can ask them what happened on May the second, and they can meet May the second of two thousand one, and they can immediately tell you what they did that day and what day of the week May the second two thousand one was. It's like they have an entire memory of everything they've done. And they're doing some experimentation. Uh, these are pretty well-known uh, human beings. I mean, throughout history, they're called savants. And they tend to be somewhat autistic. And uh, uh -huh. that's interesting. It was 60 minutes. Feature on this about four years ago. They only knew of about five or six people throughout the world that had this ability. Mm -hmm. And for instance, you can say a date, you know, like she said, uh, May the 20th, uh, 2003, and they can tell you what they had for lunch. They can tell you if they were watching TV, who was on, and so forth. It's, it's a stronger memory if they were participating in it rather than not participating in it. And so on. I think one of the things I'd be curious to know is how they keep time. Um, Did they say anything about that? They did not, but I, I will address that. Now there are probably about four or five dozen people that they're aware of in the world that have this ability. They got some of those together. And what they postulated at the end of it is that these group, these group of people don't have better memories than we have. They have a better retrieval system right. than we have. Mm -hmm. If they walk into a room and, uh, and you and I walk into a room, they have no, no greater ability to remember how many cans of soda are on the table than we do. But if they do it, you can ask them 20 years later and they'll retrieve that memory where we won't, where we'll, we will have forgotten. So it's, it's an area of the brain that re goes into those little well, oscillating memories, or whatever. Retrieval is a big deal. Yeah. Um, one of the things that it seemed to me uh, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but in understanding, especially, uh, I thought there was an interesting correspondence in that the, these very prodigious memories 
usually are accompanied by a kind of autism. That is, uh, a lack of social ability. Um, yes. Uh, these, these, these people were just like you and I. They were not savants. Okay. They could not tell you what day of the week July the 1st, 1588 was. They could only tell you their experiences. What they have lived themselves, like the savants, well, what I, what I wanted to uh, make a point about was that one of the biggest computational <laughs> problems of the brain, one of the things that brain power is really essential for, for human beings, is social interaction. And if you were to give <laughs> up some of those neurons that were, this is just speculation, but if you were to give up some of those neurons that were tied to social interaction, you'd have uh, a lot of power that would be available for something else. Uh, but to keep track of social interactions, keep track of uh, little changes of mood or feeling in people that you're close to, funny way a child is acting, uh, just keeping track of your social calendar and uh, this actually takes a lot of brain power and it takes a huge amount of brain power just to recognize faces and locate them properly. <laughs> and so I, I had a very superficial thought that, well, maybe that's what's going on since there, a lot of these savants seem to be uh, somewhat autistic is that the neurons that would have normally been used for um, social interaction which is a very demanding computational task, are now available for uh, maintaining a directory. Yes? I think it's always interesting how the definition of savant is going, what you mean by savant, perhaps what they're receiving as savants. Because just because somebody's called a savant doesn't mean that they're freakishly weird. It just means no, it's, they it's just have a term that's grown up here. Uh, the great computer scientist, uh, mathematician Alan Turing, was a very odd duck, mm -hmm. but he was, he was just brilliant, just an amazing and uh, wonderful theoretician and thinker. Um, well, maybe we should stop and we can continue, continue talking and have a little refreshment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.